when I was a kid and my mother used to read, I remember once she read um, a poem about a, a summer night, and I don't remember who wrote it, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's narrated by a kid, a child who has to go to bed before the sun goes down and he hears the activity outside on the street and it's kind of sad because he's being put to bed but life is still going on because it's summertime and it doesn't get dark until 9.30 or whatever, 9 o'clock at night. And I remember her reading that to me and I know it was the house we lived in until I was almost seven so I had to be, I don't know, four, five, six. And I remember asking her about writers and she said, you know, some writers keep a pad of paper next to their bed at night so if they have an idea they can they can write it down. So I remember that conversation. So at some I think a lot of kids think that, but at some level that was in there. It was a great place to grow up. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a big warm family. I could I could walk to the beach. I'd take a short bus ride to the beach and in those years the the um they're all amusements at the beach. Oh, really yeah. nice You're right. It's about five minutes north of downtown Boston. It's an absolutely beautiful, perfect crescent-shaped beach, three miles long. And when I was a kid in the late 50s and through the 60s, uh, on the other side of the boulevard was a long strip of amusement rides and food stands, sort of like Coney Island, that attracted people from, from all over the place. Um, Ferris wheel... Uh, Dodgems, Virginia Reel, uh, kind of rickety old roller coaster that was rumored to be unsafe. Uh, Joe and Nemo's, uh, all kinds of uh, food that's bad for you, hot dogs and <laughs> hamburgs and fried dough and pizza and stuffed quahogs. You could meet people at Revere Beach from all over the country and sometimes all over the world, which was, for me, for a really provincial kid who had never who had never been very far from home at all it was very exciting to think that uh, people from from other parts of the country and from other countries would come to our beach it was a source of pride for us and more than that i used to go to the beach and look out east over the atlantic and think that there was the there was a huge part of the rest of the world you know just on the other side of that ocean was europe and asia and it's so close to Logan Airport that um, one of the landing routes brings the planes right over Revere Beach. It seems like only a couple hundred feet off the water. So you'd, you'd be standing there and you'd see Lufthansa and El Al and Alitalia, and these, that was just so exotic for me. My mom was a, a physical therapist who volunteered for the Army uh, during World War II, and she worked at the Walter Reed Army Hospital in Washington, treating um, soldiers who had come back from the Pacific Theater, mostly uh, amputees, guys who'd lost feet, hands, legs, arms. And she not only physically tried to rehabilitate them, but part of the program was to emotionally and psychologically rehabilitate them. So. 
toward the end of their their treatment, they had to before they would be released, they had to take her out on a quote date and go through all the motions, order, take her into a restaurant, and so on. And that was a real challenge for some of those guys. Of the nation's more than 20 million veterans, around 2 million are women. One of them is 93-year-old Eileen Marullo. She was in the Army and served as a physical therapist at Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, working with soldiers who had lost limbs during World War II. Heart-wrenching, but you could never let the men see that. Otherwise, it would make them feel worse than they are, than they were. So you just had to be as cheerful as you could and honest as you could. And they were so brave, such wonderful, wonderful men. So it, it, it reached my heart to see that hospital again because instantly I went mentally right into the clinic where the men were with no arms and no legs. And you know, when, he, when they're in the hospital, it's not that di it's difficult, but not that difficult because there are other people with no arms and legs and yeah. things. Mm -hmm. But when they have to go home to their girlfriend or their neighbors or their mother, it's hard. You know, when you're in the service, if anyone comes from anywhere near your mm -hmm. area, mm -hmm. you, you want to help them a bit. So this fellow came from Chelsea. He was a lower leg amputee and came from Chelsea. So I figured, let me take very good care of him besides mm -hmm. the others. So he, uh, he was doing all right. Then he got a letter from his girlfriend. Aww. She found out that he had lost his leg. Aww. So she said, um, sorry, uh, I don't care to go with you anymore. Well, that was it. He would not do anything. He wouldn't even come to the clinic. So I went up there and told the nurse, I want him down here no matter what. And I pushed him and pushed him and pushed him until he finally got in his prosthesis and went home. So I forgot all about him, took care of others. One day, I, I was uh, a civilian at this time now, working at the Naval Hospital in Chelsea. So I went home for lunch. I have lunch with my parents. Door bell rang, my father answered, and he said, there's a gentleman to see you. And the, so ooh, I got right up, a gentleman to see me, mm -hmm. and it was he. He had come to say thank you to me uh. with a big box of chocolates and a huge bouquet, uh. and he married that girl in Chelsea. My dad was the son of Italian immigrants, uh, did very well in school, graduated in the Depression, couldn't go to college, uh, got a job picking carrots on a farm in Riviera where we grew up, and uh, eventually got into politics, eventually got a state job. But when he was 50, he decided that he wanted to go to law school. That had been his life's dream. And, but he didn't have an undergraduate education of any kind. So he, um, he went to the admissions director at Suffolk Law in Boston and talked them into letting him into law school. And he had a full-time job, age 50, three teenage sons, and uh, graduated. And it took him a few times to pass the bar, but by the time he got to be 60, he was a lawyer and uh, really a model for me of, of how to, to to keep your dream in your sights no matter what happens in life. And, and worked for an engineering firm for a while, went into politics, became a city councilor, went into bigger politics and became friends with a couple of Republican governors. Uh, I think if he knew my politics, probably he'd be turning in his grave, but uh, <laughs> he was a great guy. And the point of it is that he could be friends with anybody. He had friends from Revere who were bookies, who were low-level mafia guys, who were city workers, laborers. He had friends who were senators, judges, governors. Uh, Secretary of State of the United States was a personal, first-name basis friend of his. And he could talk to all these people. And I think because he saw them as human beings, he didn't see them as Secretary of State, or he didn't see them as a bookie. He just saw them as a human being. And it was a wonderful uh, legacy for all of us in my family. Um, so I, from him, I've inherited a few things. Uh, a little bit too much of a temper sometimes. He'd get angry very quickly. 
and it would pass very quickly, which I hope is that part of it's true for me. Um, he had a tremendous determination. He went to law school when he was 50 without a college degree, without any college education, with three sons um, and a full-time job, and became a lawyer when he was 60 and died peacefully in his sleep when he was 66. I haven't inherited that much of the determination, but I think a little bit of it. And I've also inherited, and this is what uh, leads into what I want to talk about today, this tendency to, to be comfortable talking to different kinds of people and to like talking to different kinds of people. A lot of times I'll be in the supermarket and I'm waiting in line, I'll have a conversation with somebody and my daughter will say, one of my daughters will say, Dad, do you know her? <laughs> no, I don't know. What are you talking to her? <laughs> do you know that guy? No, I never met him before. Like that. <laughs> so that can have a, a positive side and it can have a negative side. And so this little bit here is the negative side. I do a lot of traveling, sometimes for work, sometimes to see my family who still live in uh, Riviera. And one night after a trip like this, I was coming home on the Mass Pike, probably 11, 11.30 at night, a little bit tired, and there's, um, there's one last rest stop before you head up Route 91 and toward where we live. And I pulled into that rest area, and I wanted to get my, you know, a bottle of water and a bag of cashews or something. And I parked my car, and I'm, I get out in a box truck parked next to me. These two guys got out. And I'm walking into the restaurant, and one of the guys says, hey, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. I figured he was going to say, you know, how do you get to Greenfield or something. And he said, um, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And I think we all know the kind of person or where that's coming from when someone asks you that in a parking lot at 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> most people I know would just say, yeah, thank you, and see you later. I gotta, I gotta hurry, I gotta get home to my kids or something like that. But because of what I inherited from my father, I stopped to talk to this guy, much to my regret. And uh, I said, look, I'm, I'm a very religious person and I respect you but I just have a different way of talking about those things. I have a different way of thinking about those things. And he said, well, you're going to go to hell. You're, you're damned, you're going to go to hell, and you're going to burn forever unless you accept Jesus Christ. So at that point, the other 5% of people who already wouldn't have walked away, would have walked away. <laughs> but I stopped to continue the conversation. And I said, look, all right. I said, there's a kid in China. He's a 10-year-old kid. Never hurt anybody in his life. Wonderful to his parents, wonderful to his siblings. Goes and sees his grandparents every day and brings him food. He's walking to school one day, a little bit distracted. Gets hit by a train and killed. Are you telling me that your all-loving, all-merciful God is going to condemn that boy to burn in the fire of hell for all eternity with no hope of getting out? The guy said, yes. I said, well, how can that be? I mean, he said, because the boy's cursed. I said, the boy grew up a thousand miles from the nearest Bible. How is he going to accept Jesus Christ as his personal savior? He said, he's cursed. He's going to hell. He's going to burn forever. I said, well, that's no God for me. And the guy went absolutely crazy. He started to yell. He started to wave his arms, kind of get in my face a little bit. I had taken a few years of karate. I was trying to remember what you did. <laughs> You know, and um, luckily his friend grabbed him, and I walked, at that point finally I gave up on the conversation and walked away and never saw the guy again. Four grandparents, all of whom lived within walking distance of my house in Riviera. My mother's mother was from England, and though crippled by rheumatoid arthritis, she could uh, recite poetry from memory by the hour in a beautiful speaking voice, uh, one that I, I still hear sometimes as I'm writing. My mother's father was a factory foreman for 47 years, a great athlete. He played semi-pro baseball into his 50s. He hunted and fished. He also played chess and painted and said the rosary on his knees every night of his adult life. 
My father's father uh, was my buddy, he was my pal. I saw him every day of my life until he died when I was 12. He was teaching me Italian, he taught me to play cards, took me on excursions into Boston, sometimes when my parents didn't know about it, and um, taught me a lot about uh, a way, the way of being a man in this world. Very important lesson for me. But my father's mother, whose name was Eleonora, Eleonora Marullo, was a particularly special person, and I'd like to dedicate this talk to her. She lived downstairs from us, and then we moved next door, so I saw her all the time until she died when I was uh, between my junior and senior year in college. She was not a celebrity. She didn't have her name in the newspapers, maybe when she was married, and, and when she died, her obituary, and that's about it. She did not have an impressive resume. She did not have any resume at all. She was not educated, uh, not even through high school, I believe. She never worked a paying job for a day in her life. And when she died, 2,000 people came to her wake. I have a little story about her that I'll tell you at the end of this talk, but. For now, I just want to say that she was a person who spent a great deal of time cultivating what I call the interior world, the invisible, mysterious interior world. As I said, she, uh, she raised eight children, 28 grandchildren. She cooked and cleaned and shopped. So obviously, she was not just sitting home praying. She was active in the external world. But if, but if you interrupted her when she was saying the rosary, walked into her kitchen, she would greet you with this incredible smile, she'd give you the warmest hug imaginable, she'd stand up and cook you something, and while you were, whether you had eaten five minutes ago or not didn't matter, and while you were eating, if you were older than about 10, she would ask you about your love life, because she believed that the greatest happiness in life was finding someone to love. But it was not a realistic professional option for me. I didn't know any writers. It's not like on Essex Street there were, you know, three or four novelists there. They just weren't. <laughs> and they weren't at magazine writers even. And so it was somewhat like, you know, a kid nowadays saying, I want to go be a farmer on Mars when I grow up. You know, it just was not real. And people said, I was a good well in school, and people said you should be a doctor, so I, I went, you know, what are you going to be when you grow up early? I'm going to be a doctor. I didn't know from anything what being a doctor was, you know. <laughs> but I kept that in my mind. I went to first year at BU, I took pre-med, you know. And it wasn't until I came home with my report card and showed my father, I remember, sitting on the back porch, and I had an A- minus in Russian history, a B in Russian, a B- minus in Russian a C in biology and a D plus in chemistry. <laughs> and I said, Pa, I don't think, you know, I don't think the doctor thing is going to work, you know. <laughs> but I did a lot of other things and finally when I was 25 and I was actually kind of a low point in my life. I had left the Peace Corps early. I felt ashamed of that, that I had quit early. I was really sick physically. I was completely broke. I was living in Alston with my girlfriend and driving a cab and just not feeling good about myself at all. And I remember kind of having a talk with myself and saying, you know, for the rest of your life, what do you want to wake up and do? Yeah. 
and, and as much as I enjoyed driving a cab, that was not the answer to that question. I did like it, but, and it was, the answer was finally, I was finally at age 25 able to admit to myself that what I wanted to do was be a working writer for, you know, that's what I wanted to do as a profession, and that, then I really devoted myself to it, and at, at, thankfully I had a great wife, and she was willing to make you know, a lot of sacrifices. I didn't work full time. Most of the time I just wrote. We, we took trip. We went and lived in Mexico so I could write, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. And 12 years later, 12 years of really, really devoting myself to it, I had um, Hope Mifflin bought Leaving Los Office. Yeah, I had two cousins who served in Vietnam, and I had 37 first cousins, and I was very close to them. They were more like brothers and sisters, really. Um, my father's parents lived downstairs from us, and then next door to us for most of my childhood, and they were Italian family, and they had eight kids, and all those kids, uh, all their spouses and all their kids came to their house every Sunday of my childhood. So I had like a festival every week in the backyard. <laughs> And I had two cousins, one on that side and one on my mother's side uh, from an English family who went to Vietnam. One was a Marine um, medevac helicopter pilot and one was an Army infantryman and both of them saw a tremendous amount of action and combat. And, and you know, I was, just, I, I, I was just on the young side of the Vietnam era. I did have a draft number in the last year that they were drafting people, but it was a high number so I didn't get drafted. But, um, I, I, I knew these people very well and I felt for what they had gone through and I saw what happened to them when they came home and, um, and I was with a friend in Chico, California and I happened to read a newspaper article about Vietnam veterans who had come back to America but did not want to integrate back into society and they lived up in the mountains in the Sierras and, and really lived a, almost a primitive life. And I had been in the Peace Corps in Micronesia and lived a primitive life. And I put those two things together. I wanted to write about Micronesia. I, it was a tremendous experience for me. I, I wanted to have a character there, but I didn't want him to be a Peace Corps volunteer. And then I read that article in the course of writing the book, and so I made him a Vietnam veteran. So that's how that happened. And then he comes back to Revere, and that's part of my Revere thing. Plus, we traveled all over the country. There were some closed cities we couldn't go to. But um, I was in Irkutsk, Tashkent, Tbilisi, uh, rostov na Danu, Kiev, um, what was then Leningrad, Moscow several times, Ufa. So we really, you know, east to west and north, north to south. We, we, we showed what we wanted to show to a lot of people. There was a program in the Cold War uh, to counter Soviet propaganda. Mm -hmm. um, the United States government sent these huge traveling exhibitions on American life into the country and um, we paid the Soviets a lot of money to let us do that, otherwise they wouldn't have. 
and they were manned by 25 Russian-speaking Americans, and they were free. The lines would be sometimes a mile long to get in. Mm -hmm. People would come in, 15,000 people a day, um, and they would just ask questions about America. You know, every question you can think of. How much does a loaf of bread cost? Why are you in Vietnam? When I first went there, it was the 70s. Uh -huh. Why are the police always beating students and who are demonstrating against it? You know, those kinds of things. And mm -hmm. um, it was a wonderful experience for me. Was it really? Oh, the people were incredibly nice to us. The KGB harassed us, but the average people were incredibly nice to us. Very curious about the America because they couldn't leave their own country. Mm -hmm. They knew the information they were getting was very limited. Many of them did. And, you think uh, they do? Because I would hear that. They invited us to their mean. homes and uh, they were incredibly generous. Wow. Yeah, it was a big surprise for me. It changed my whole way of thinking about the world. That How did um, your Russia experience? Uh, influence or feed into what what you do as a writer? I can't overstate that because it's um, it had a gigantic influence on me and my wife Amanda who was with me for the second two exhibitions says the same thing. It was a huge part of our life. For me I, I had lived a very insular life until I got on that plane. The first time I ever got on an airplane was when I was in training in DC we flew to New York City. So I had led a, a really a provincial life, and um, all of a sudden I was exposed to this utterly different way of thinking and being, an utterly different political system and economic system. And I spoke with thousands and thousands of people from Kalhozniki to, you know, when I was director to secretaries and cabinet level people, and it was a real education in life for me not just in, in Soviet life or Russian life, but in life, in meeting people so different from the people I grew up with. And it just, it, it, it opened my mind up in a way that I, I can't, you know, my business is describing things, I can't even describe it, but it, it, it really changed my being inside and out. Did, did you draw on experiences in uh, some of your works, characters, um, things that you, you played out in real life uh, in your fiction? I think I write from a place where people are people and really 99% the same. You know, we have the same desires, the same fears, the same hopes. Um, most of our biology is the same, even if we are of different races or a different gender. Um, and I think that's always been my attitude and probably was reinforced by having been in the Soviet Union. One thing that was shocking to me was I grew up in a fairly conservative family and my, and not a particularly uh, well-educated family or environment. And so our impression of the Soviet, we didn't call them Soviet, the Russians were that they were aggressive, hateful to us, backward. And when I went there and got to know people, there was some of that. You know, there was some backwardness, there was some hatred, and there was some aggression. But really, I really broke through that assumption, and I, I began to see that they were really people, and um, really mostly wanted what we wanted, despite the fact that their system was a very different system. Their culture really isn't as different. And the Soviets said that to us again and again, and, and it really surprised me. They would say, of all the countries on Earth, of all the people on earth, we feel closest to you. And I thought, what? More than the Poles or the Czechs or the Bulgarian? No, we feel closest to you. And I think some of that had to do with the fact that we were the two superpowers. We were the two countries who could end civilization as we knew it. But also there's a certain pride that we have in common. I think Americans have that pride. And it's kind of a big country, powerful country. Uh, in their case, they have a, a longer history but they're proud of their literature as we are. You know, they made a, they've made an impact on the world and as we have. And there was much more commonality there than I had expected to find. Most people are curious. Sometimes we get invited to homes or invited out for a cup of tea. And then there were always the people who were belligerent. Uh, often we heard, Unas Lucha, we have it better. You know, we'd show them a, a picture of a supermarket aisle with fresh fruits and things that you could never find in the Soviet Union. And someone in the crowd, inevitably, several people would say, 
we have it better than you. So there was that competitive feeling and the KGB would sometimes send in provocateurs who could be really nasty. You know, I mean, they would yell at us. They would really get right in your face and call you a liar in front of a bunch of people. And uh, we were followed after work and harassed in different ways that were really unpleasant. And um, so it was a mixture of a, a warm, welcoming curiosity and then this other side that was um, definitely in the minority, but uh, memorable, memorable. After after writing for 12 years, I got Leaving Los Alpes published, and then two years later, Russian Requiem was published, and I kind of thought, okay, I have a career. It's going to be every couple of years I'll publish a book. You know, it was Holt Mifflin and Little Brown, which were good publishers. And then I just had a stretch of really bad luck that I could not get a book published for about five years, and it really was shook me. Um, and especially since Alexandra, who's sitting here, was just born, 1997. Amanda stopped, my wife stopped working. I had a part-time teaching job at Bennington College. And I, you know, I was looking at my career just evaporating. And I remember my cousin John, who we just, ashes we just interred at Woodlawn about a month ago, who was a Marine medevac pilot in Vietnam, and would occasionally call me and ask how things were going. And he said, um, you know, how's things going? I said, terrible. I'm, I don't know what's going on. I can't, I have this book. I thought it was a really good book and nobody wants it. My agent looks like she's about to give up on it. You know, I'm, my career could have just evaporated, which happens to writers fairly frequently. And he said, never, ever, 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 ever give up. And that was one of the great things that was ever said to me in my life. And it just, you know, there was nothing else I could do, but mentally he was saying that. And I respected that, especially given what he had been through. And um, I remember it was January 20th, 1998. Alexandra was a month and three days old. And I came home just after dark. It was a freezing cold winter in Massachusetts. And Amanda was holding Zanny at the front door. And she said, tell daddy the good news, <laughs> you know which obviously she could not do at that age. I think it was about a week after that you could have. Um, and it was, a, it was a big deal for me that that was published. And then Amanda has this really beautiful photograph on the cover. So Revivage Boulevard is an important book for me in that way. It was a revere night. The night the life I'd been holding together all these years started pulling apart. A nice revere night near the end of August with salt in the air and garden smells floating over to us where we sat and the sky above Proctor Avenue lit up with a light that was like paradise breaking open and pouring down all over you. Before the phone call came that would take my life and turn her inside out like the sleeve on a jacket, I was sitting in the yard with the woman I'd been husband and wife with 49 years, the woman who was the other half of my body. We were waiting for the moon to come up over Patsy Antonelli's roof. 
big she would be coming up. You could tell by the light between the houses that she would be coming up big on that night, the full circle of her, the full perfect face. Do you have any pain, Lucy? I asked my wife, and she said no, quiet, in a voice that meant, don't keep asking, Vito, so I didn't. That, just that little moment, and even Lucy wasn't even in the first moment when I really, I knew he was sitting out there and I thought, Again, it's, there had to be a little bit of juice. Or what's the tension? You have a guy sitting out in his yard watching the moon rise, big deal. You know, what, what, what's the power in that? But it turns out he's sitting out there with his wife who maybe has another two or three days to live. And all of a sudden, that moment takes on a, a, a different weight completely. I'm a nine handicap. I'm not exactly a great golfer. I, I, I take second place to no one in my love for the game, but... I'm not a great player. I didn't start playing till till I was in my 40s. But it's not really, there's no swing advice. It's about mental states, which I think, are, and a lot of other people think, are really the most important thing in golf. Yes, you know? I do too. You, you, can't, you know, you've potted every hole on the course you play. You probably birdied every hole. Why can't you do that all the time? Because your mind is in a certain place when you get up to the ball. And I'm not, you know. I'm not advising people. I'm just musing on the philosophy of the game and telling some anecdotes from my own very varied experiences playing good, bad, and ugly. Good. <laughs> and don't we all? This is a story of the rescue of one soul. It's the story of an ordinary kid who had all the shell burned off him, all the armor. Something like that happens to most people in the course of a life, I think, though not usually at such a young age. It takes different forms, the death of a parent, spouse, or close friend, divorce, disappointment, disability. Afterward, you go through the world naked and raw, skinless, hopeless. Sometimes the pain only grows worse as the years pass and you end your life in a cold pool of despair. Other times, if you are lucky or blessed, or as the Buddhists would say, if your karma is good, someone comes along and heals you or helps you heal yourself. I have lived now healed and at peace for half a life without ever feeling much inclination to tell this story. But two winters ago, after 18 childless years of marriage, my wife Regina gave birth to a daughter. Our luck our blessing, our good karma. And then just about the time Rosalie reached the age where she was beginning to learn words, I was overtaken by an urge to write this down, to make it public, for her to read some day, I suppose, for myself, for the people who raised me. I just sat there and said, Look, what matters to me? What do I really care about? And so I started to write this um, a story that's really largely autobiographical, although there's a lot of things happened in that book that did not happen to me in my life. Um, and I think I was in the grips of a kind of nostalgia for the way I grew up. And I grew up in this city, surrounded by two, by, by a whole bunch of relatives. My mother's from a family of seven kids, my father from a family of eight kids. They all, almost all of them had children, so I had all these cousins. They, and we lived either upstairs from my grandfather and grandmother or next door to them for really my whole uh, upbringing. And at least the Marulo side of that family would come to my yard every day, every Sunday for my whole childhood. So I would see these cousins every week. I'd see my aunts and uncles every week, if not more frequently than that. And my mother's family, with the exception of... Uh, one strange branch that moved to Indiana for some reason uh, that I'm actually very close to. Um, they were walking distance, most of them also. So there was this feeling of uh, being almost in a, a nest of some kind. So, uh, that's not a good image. A feeling of just being in a warm place surrounded by people who cared about you. And uh, I think I was in the grips of that feeling that because that's not something most of us carry into adulthood, at least in my experience. I have a great family now, 
but we're really removed. We don't see our cousins all the time. We certainly don't have that many cousins. We don't see our aunts and uncles all the time. That kind of warmth and closeness is difficult to preserve as you move out into other places in the world. You have your own life, you have your own career. So I think I was in the grip, and maybe because I had a small child and I was, you know, that, that family feeling had been reawakened in me. Um, I think that was what was going on inside me when I started to write interview in those days. My oldest daughter, uh, who's four, uh, went swimming with me, and that was a very special feeling, which I know I noticed some of your other guests have mentioned, the idea that my, my parents were there swimming and took me there, and now I'm taking my children. It's, it's really a wonderful thing. I loved going to Exeter. It was a great thing that my parents did for me. I went to St. John's Prep for two years first. But at the same time, it was a completely different world for me. You know, if I just took one example, I mean, all, my father and mother had hundreds and scores of friends. We always called them by their first name. You know, Sherman Bennett um, was never Mr. Bennett. He was all, always Sherman Bennett. Mike DeMarco, who was a judge in the Somerville Court, was not Mr. DeMarco. He wasn't, certainly wasn't Judge DeMarco. You know, Spudsy Moshe wasn't Mr. Moshe. He was Spudsy. And at Exeter, all of a sudden, the adults were Mr. and, and Mrs. at that time. You know, it's one small example, but it was really a different world for me. I was comfortable there. I liked it right away. But there was a part of me that was torn. torn. I, I left my place and went to this other world where the adults dressed differently, where the sense of humor was completely different, where the accent was different, where the way people talked about money was completely different, where the food was absolutely radically different. Yeah. So who was I? Was I the kid from Essex Street playing block ball? Or was I the kid sitting around the Harkness table discussing Dostoevsky? You know? And I think all of us probably at some point in our life had that happen. We, we move out of our childhood into our adulthood, and sometimes that adulthood is thousands or hundreds of miles away. It might be in a different class economically or by virtue of education. And then who are you? So really, that's what that book is about. And it, it, if you look at the epigraph of that book, which I haven't memorized, it really sums that up. So it was a way for me of really beginning to sew those two parts of myself together and figure out what, what do I make out of the kid from Essex Street and the kid from the Harkness table, which is a round table where all the Exeter classes are held. You know, who's that person really? Who am I truly in the world? And so that's what that book really is. And there are really explicit passages to that effect in the book uh, where Tony is trying to figure out, like, you know, where should I be? Where should I go in the world? How do I retain my accent? I, I work, you have no idea how hard I work to retain my, I, not a week goes by, and, and not counting my children, which would be not a day goes by, but outside my own family, 
not a week goes by without someone remarking on my accent. Usually in a friendly, but right, Leanne, a friendly way, but it, it can, it, you know, I can see why th there's a lot of pressure to just talk like everybody else. I just can't do it. I, I can't make my mouth do that, you know. <laughs> I speak a couple of other languages, but I can't speak standard American, you know. <laughs> and it's really funny because my wife's from Connecticut and speaks, you know, good American English, and the girls speak like her. And so when they were growing up, for example, I remember my daughters thought yoga was spelled Y-O-G-E-R, because if it had been, that's the way I would say it, yoga. That's how I would say it, you know. So, uh, I w and I know I've lost some of it, but uh, I, real I, I think I'll go to the grave saying, this is so hard, you know. Uh, I want to say to you that the, the local people here, I think, are very kind, generous, hospitable group of people. I'm sure they will treat you to a good uh, Greater Boston welcome. But I have to caution you that they talk in a very strange <laughs> dialect, in case you haven't already noticed. I, I, I believe I talk in that same dialect, so I understand them pretty well. Um, the problem with it, of course, is that we say about 95% of words the same way that you do which is called standard English, although that's not how they say it. Um, and then every once in a while, we'll hit you with the word like corner, or art, or popcorn, or hardware store, or something like that. And you'll fall behind the conversation the way you fall behind those of you who have ever studied a, f a foreign language. You're going along pretty well, and then all of a sudden, you have to be thinking, what did that person just say? What's hardware store? And you kind of miss out on stuff. Um, but don't be alarmed by that. It's really a harmless accent. Uh, in a week or two or a month, you'll get used to it. Uh, it might even rub off on you a little bit. You might go back to North Carolina or Missouri and tell your parents that you need to go get something at the hardware store, and they'll say, what, what did she just say? Why did we send her to live with those people? Actually, uh, harmless as it is, it did almost get me in a lot of trouble one time, and I have to tell this story. It happened when I was a little bit older than most of you students. I had finished graduate school and traveled across country with a friend of mine named Fudd. And Fudd stayed out in California to become an actor, try to become an actor. And I, after a few weeks, returned home in a VW bug with three people I didn't know two beautiful young women I'll never forget as long as I live, and a crazy young man who I probably always will also remember as long as I live. Uh, the first night leaving Los Angeles, we slept out in a date palm grove outside of Palm Springs, California, and the owner of that grove came by and shot a shotgun over our heads because he didn't like us on his property. The second night, we slept out near the Grand Canyon, which, for those of you who don't know, in October is freezing cold area of America. And the third night, I drove all night while the young man and young women argued. I drove in the rain through Texas and ended up stopping at a roadside diner in Little Rock, Arkansas, about 3 a.m. Uh, I had fairly long hair. I hadn't bathed in three days. I hadn't shaved in a few days. Um, I was exhausted. Um, very hungry, and for some reason, when the food was served, my three companions w were in the bathroom, and uh, the waitress brought me the meal, and I have this quirky habit. I have certain foods I don't like to eat with my fingers, and like french fries, and um, so when she brought me the food, there was something was missing, and uh, it was that utensil that is neither a knife nor a spoon. <laughs> and so here I am looking, disheveled would be a nice word for the way I look, and this cute young waitress serves me the food and I say to her, I need a fork. <laughs> That's absolutely true. And being the kind 
person that she was, she did not go into the kitchen and get her boyfriend to come out with a butcher knife. But she looked at me for about five or ten seconds. I'm still wondering exactly what was going on in her mind. She looked at me and, and finally she said, can I get you a cup of coffee? <laughs> so the accent is, is mostly harmless if baffling and you should, you should feel free during my uh, short talk here if you don't understand something I say to turn to if, uh, people who grow, grew up in or near Revere, Massachusetts and get a simultaneous translation. Of my editor, who I really love, Shea Earhart, um, a couple of years earlier, had, I, had run in, I had run past her the thought of writing a book about CF. And she said, no, people don't want to read about illness. They don't want to read about sick kids. They, they don't. And I said, okay, and I didn't write it. Mm -hmm. um, but that night when I started A Little Love Story, I thought, you know, forget that. I'm gonna, I, I think I can write it in such a way that people will want to read it. So I put some humor in there, I put a little bit of sex in there, tastefully, <laughs> I hope. And, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to, s the subject matter is a heavy subject matter, and I wanted mm -hmm. to soften it a little bit. The one thing I did not want to do was make a mistake uh, with, that someone who has that illness would mm -hmm. recognize and be upset by. So I really was careful. I know a lot about it just because of our personal situation, but I, I spent a lot of time talking to doctors. Mm -hmm talking to parents, talking to patients. Mm -hmm. uh, the, if you look at the beginning of the book, there's a huge long list of people I thank, and yes. they, you know, all those people contributed in some way. It's an important part of the book because yeah. I think sometimes we um, all mistake a person for their illness. In other mm -hmm. words, Janet is a young woman with cystic fibrosis. She is not cystic fibrosis. Exactly. Right? She has all these other qualities. She's brilliant. She's funny. She's sexy. She's fun to be around. She cares about life. She cares about people. And she has cystic fibrosis. And mm -hmm. so Jake is, to his credit, the kind of guy who can see that. And he's willing to deal with some of the um, inconveniences, some of the emotional difficulties that go with loving someone who has a physical problem. In today's Boston Globe, is a great piece by this guy, Roland Marolo. He offers another theory. He suggests Trump's popularity could be rooted in humiliation. He argues that Trump could be tapping into the weary working class soul. What do you think of this guy's piece? I thought it was brilliant. So did I. I thought it was absolutely so brilliant. He, he makes the point that there is obviously some racism here that, and there's some bigotry here. The concept is not wildly original. Using the word humiliation to me was perfect. He really captured it brilliantly. Many people keep a stack of books by the bed, all recommended by friends, all but certain to be worth the read. But often, it's the novel you happen upon by chance that has the greatest impact. That was the case for author Roland Morello. He has this story of how a paperback he picked up on a whim has shaped his own writing. It's for our series, You Must Read This, where authors talk about a book they love. January marked the 40th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision legalizing abortion, and most people know the polarizing and sometimes violent debate that followed Roe v. Wade. It would seem an impossible divide to bridge, but Roland Marullo says we have to try. He's a fiction author who lives here in the Massachusetts area and made his case for detente in the Boston Globe.
I really have the habit or uh, passion for reading religious material across the whole spectrum, not just Christian. Yeah. And um, psych psychology also, for, for whatever reason, yeah. m much more than I even read novels, I read religion and psychology. And I, I think it is, it should be accessible to everyone. It's about the human condition. It's not supposed to be some esoteric study reserved for the university. Exactly. If it doesn't apply to your, your everyday life, it's no good. That's so right. that's just the way I think about it, so that when, when I write it, it comes out I that think way. Yeah. generally speaking in our age, there are some people that are very comfortable with their tradition. I have plenty of cousins who go to church, go to Mass every Sunday, and that, that's fine for them. And there's other people who are not comfortable, whether they grew up Jewish, Protestant, my wife grew up Congregational, Catholic, whatever, whatever. They just, they're not quite comfortable with the way that faith has, has evolved, and yet they want to have some kind of spiritual life. And that's me, and I think th those are the people I write for, you know, that they, they're not, they haven't given up. They just, they, they want, it's not that they want it exactly their own way, but they want, they want their spiritual urges to be channeled in a way that makes sense to them. So, that, you know, that's just coming out of me. I'm not. That, that is true of me. And so when I write, I think that goes into the book. Well, you've got everybody up there in heaven. I mean, every religion possible. Buddha's playing golf. Buddha's a very calm player. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, Mary plays. Jesus plays. Uh, all that, you know. I loved it when I heard, um, nice shot, Mom. Yeah. That was, my, <laughs> that was... That's my mother's favorite. Jesus and Mary are playing, and Mary hits as a beginner, really, and she hits a pretty good ball, and, and he says that to her. That's my mother's favorite line in the book. And my, my mother's a devout Catholic, so if she doesn't take offense, I don't think anybody will. This was about 2000 or 2001, and we have two daughters, and the oldest girl then was three, and the youngest girl, my wife was still pregnant with the youngest girl, and the oldest girl got diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. And it was a terrible winter here in New England, deep snow, cold, just really depressing. The whole household was kind of blanketed with a dark mood, and I felt responsible for that. And I didn't have, you know, I'm, I'm a writer by profession. My income goes up and down. That was a down period. I didn't have a lot of money. So I came up with this brilliant idea to write golf courses in the southeast, and see if they wanted to invite me and my wife and our daughter and my 80-year-old mother who played to their golf resorts in the high season for little or no money. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of, it, 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 On its face, is a beautiful idea. And, you know, not surprisingly, I think I sent out 50 letters and, and probably... 35 of the places didn't even bother to respond, and 10 of them wrote back and said, no chance. But there were four people, four places, Ford's Colony um, in Virginia, Pauley's Plantation in South Carolina, Chateau Elan in Georgia, and the Greenbrier in West Virginia, who actually, believe it or not, wrote back and said, you know, we'd like to host you, and some places was free for a couple of days, and some places, like Paulie's, uh, which is a great place, that, that was, uh, I think we paid the cleaning fee for two weeks with free golf for some unbelievably generous offer. So we did this, and I said, you know, I'm going to write a book about this, and I wrote a nonfiction book called Every Golfer's Dream about the experience, you know, driving, getting out of the cold, driving with my family, playing a lot of golf, and nobody wanted the book. But I felt indebted to these people who had been so generous. So I changed the book into a novel, and I started it in heaven. And they eventually come to Earth and play at those resorts. And um, and then and the book got grabbed by Algonquin and sold very well. So I, I feel glad that I was able to repay their generous. I mean, I don't advertise for them or anything like no. that, but I wanted to mention, and I made the, the four people who actually invited us, I made them into angels. <laughs> so, and it were. really helped us in a tough time. This is um, it's a wonderful book because I I just found myself relating to it on so many different levels and and enjoyed it immensely. 
religion can be important in people's life. First of all, I feel like everybody has a religion. Even if you call yourself an atheist, you have a religion. It's a belief system. It's, yeah. it's what you formulate to make life make sense to you. <laughs> and if your formulation is, you know, nothing matters, everything's random, okay, that's your theory. That's what you live by. And I think of that as your religion. Right. And I think we right. all do that. We, we, make, we make life have meaning for us. Yeah. By we'll formulating some kind of an idea of what it's supposed to be about. Yeah. Even if the idea is it's not about anything. You know, you live, yeah. you die, that's the end of it. That's your religion. That's the way I look at it. And um, I grew up among people for whom religion was very important, Catholicism, and very helpful. They were really good people. The, the churches we went to were, was a healthy environment. And I saw what it did for people, and, and I still have a great reverence for that aspect mm -hmm. of the church. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't like exclusivity. I don't, uh, in any religion, there, mm -hmm. are, there, are, uh, there are groups within the religion that say, you know, we have the truth and you don't. So God loves us and God doesn't love you. That doesn't work for me. And really, I'm, I've devoted a lot of the last four or five books to... I don't want to say attacking that, but dealing with that issue, mm -hmm. talking about Examining that Examining it yeah. and... And confronting yeah. it. In a know. nice way. Yeah. In a nice way. In I'm a not a, nice not way. a particularly... I don't, I don't write to upset people. Right. I write to provoke, but not, not provoke to anger, but just to make people think, think about think. things. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't have a particular agenda, like I'm trying to convince somebody of something. But, but I would like to see religion be more universal. I would like to see us agree more because I have read across the whole religious spectrum and really th there's so much commonality there. If you just stay with the basics and you don't get into the rules, mm -hmm. there's, there's, not, there's not that big a difference between what Muhammad said, what Jesus said, what Buddha said, what Moses said, really. And what like, common sense says. Yeah, right. <laughs> so yeah. that's where I come from, you know, yeah. and um, I just write as sincerely as I can, and so what's inside me ends up being inside the books. I got a phone call from my editor at Algonquin, Chuck Adams, and he said, um, he said, you know, we did well with Golfing with God, we really liked it, and we, w we would like you to write another book along the same lines, not, not about golf. Uh, and this book really isn't about golf, although there's a lot of golf in it, but some kind of quirky, philosophical, spiritual book. Would you be interested in doing that? I said, yeah, I'd be interested. That, that, you know, I'm happy to do that. And he said, do um, you have any ideas? And I didn't really, but I didn't want to say no, so I said, yeah, I have. I thought for a second, and I, I, said, <laughs> I said, yeah, I have an idea. Um, I'd like to drive to North Dakota and write a book about it. And there was this awful silence at the end of the, the other end of the line. And he said, y you know, can you give me some more details? <laughs> and I said, not really, but I'd been to like 43 or 44 states by then, and I had never been to North Dakota, and I had this image in my mind that it was stark, beautiful, somehow spiritual, which is a word I really don't like, but evocative in some way. And, um, I love to drive. I thought, you know, I could probably, that would be fun to do, and maybe I could make a good book out of it. And um, so he said, do you have any more details? I said, no, I don't. He said, okay. And, and I like to say they, they made me an advance, uh, an offer that was commensurate with their enthusiasm for that idea. <laughs> Not too much. The story more than held my interest all the way to the end. Through attempts at yoga, riddles, and stories, Otto eventually began to appreciate what Rinpoche had to offer. Otto declares himself a Christian without regular church attendance. He finds repellent Christians who believe what, quote, ails us is more in stricter rules, more narrow-mindedness, more hatred, more sectioning off of the society. And it has always seemed to me that if Christ's message could be distilled down to one line, that line would have to do with kindness and inclusiveness, not rules and divisiveness, unquote. The last couple of chapters sum up what Otto has gained on the journey. The reluctant hero of the story really learns a lot about himself and his life. He always insists he has a good life with a loving wife, two great kids, and a good job he loved. 
but Rinpoche pushes him to experience more. Marullo writes, Something was changing us with each breath, each second. The delusion of youth was that you'd believe you'd never reach middle age, and the delusion of middle age made you believe you could go on more or less indefinitely the way things were. Yes, the kids would grow up. Yes, you'd grow old and eventually pass away. But really, there were so many pleasures to be had between now and then, so many tennis games, so many meals, so many weeks at the Cape in the ski lodge, so tremendously much to do before that other stage of life eventually set in. Marillo's Breakfast with Buddha is a pleasant and thought-provoking read. Five stars. But really, in answer to your question, the way that North Dakota was in my mind, nothing else is now. I, I, had, I had this image of it as a place, and I have been a lot of places. Um, I had this image of it as a place somehow that would be mysterious. And it actually turned out to be true. It was very strange for me. It turned out to be a lot like I imagined it. And uh, maybe that had been from seeing pictures or being in South Dakota, I don't know. But, you know, these, there's a great joke a friend from Minnesota told me about North, the Minnesotans say about North Dakota, you can watch your dog run away for three days. <laughs> and it's true, you know, you get up, and the western part of the state has this incredible, and maybe parts of Colorado like this I haven't seen, but beautiful rolling brown prairie land, and every five minutes it changes somehow, and then in the southwest corner it looks like the Grand Canyon and very sparsely populated. I mean, you could drive 20, 30, 40, 50 miles on country roads and not even see a house. And uh, that somehow, it was, that had a mysterious element to me. Uh, Russia had that a little bit for me, actually. Being behind the Iron Curtain, being closed off from what we sometimes call civilization, which I think is wrong, but it had a certain mystery to it and I took the Trans-Siberian and I got out in some pretty remote parts of the eastern Russia. And, uh, and, this, and I was in the Peace Corps in Micronesia for a little while in a, in a tiny little, on a tiny little atoll um, 60 miles from electricity or plumbing or anything like that. And I remember the moment I was dropped off at, on the, by the field trip ship on that little island, I had this incredible experience of becoming detached from the human world. Obviously, there were humans on the island, not so many. You could walk around the island in 15 minutes, but there was this vast ocean and sky and clouds and a tiny little bit of humanity, and I had a very unusual feeling at that moment. It it was almost like seeing the world from outside of being a human being briefly. Somehow, those things are connected that in Russia and North Dakota. <laughs> he likes to eat, and he's, you know, he's, uh, he's better off financially probably than I am. He lives in a place that's wealthier than where I live. Um, I live in a perfectly nice place, but he's a family guy. You know, he cares mostly. His, his idea of, be, of what he should do in life is to be a good dad, be a good husband, he believes in God, but mostly in a, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't require much of him. He doesn't go to services. He does volunteer work in a poor neighborhood. Um, and he's a good, you know, all-around good human being, I think. Um, but what I hope, one of the things I tried to do in the book was have Rinpoche show him what else he could be doing. And that really, for me personally, came from my grandmother. I grew up, uh, I grew up upstairs from her and then next door to her until she died when I was about 20 one, and um, she embodied a spiritual person to me in, in the right way. She went to church, she said the rosary, she said her prayers, but in addition to that, the times when she wasn't going to church, she was, doing, she was cultivating her inner life in, in a way, and cooking for all these people, and you know, buying Christmas gifts for all her grandchildren. And, and just the way she treated people was exceptional and it made a deep impression on me. And so I put those two things together in in my own life that, you know, some people like that without any spirit, with it, never praying, never meditating. But for me, those, the fact that she did those things and was that way made a very deep imprint on me. 
I think they came to me because it's a combination of two of my most passionate interests, politics and religion. Uh, I tend to write about things that are very close to my heart rather than at an intellectual remove. And from a very young age, I was interested in politics. My dad was a local politician who ended up working for a couple of Massachusetts governors, and he used to take me up to the elementary school at the top of the street and let me watch as the votes were counted late on election night, and that was a thrill for a young boy. And I'm a devout person in my own offbeat way. I don't uh, really stick to one particular religion, but I have a, a meditation practice that I've had for many years, and I read widely across the spectrum of religions, mostly the mystical literature. So I think the idea grew out of that soil. The last thing on earth I want to be seen as is someone who's preaching or trying to convert. I'm absolutely not trying to do that, but I am trying to provoke in the sense of uh, provoke people to think about big questions and I think if you do that and don't use humor, you're on very thin ice. Ernesto Salvador walked alone down an ink-dark street near the northern edge of Old Havana. In the right front pocket of his jeans was a single yellow cyanide tablet, half the size of his thumbnail, and when he saw the headlights wash across the buildings in front of him, and heard the bubbling sound of truck tires coming fast along the cobblestones, he found himself running his fingers along the outside of his pocket to make certain the pill was there. The truck was less than a hundred meters behind him. In as casual a way as he could, he turned right down a narrow street, little more than an alley, where the darkness was almost unbroken. He looked for a doorway to duck into, a courtyard, a car bumper to hide behind, but the street was empty and the walls of the buildings offered him nothing but stone and darkness. Spend three days walking every street in old Havana as I did, and you'll encounter a museum of poverty with glorious tattered colonial architecture as background. Ride out into the suburbs and you'll find the squalor of Soviet-style apartment buildings, rust-stained, poorly built, aesthetically bankrupt. No one should live in such monstrosities. To my kind far-left friends, I'm sorry, but this is not what success looks like. And to my angry far-right friends in the Cuban-American community, the people you have hurt are your own people. Cuba, so rich in resources and history, deserves better than to be a victim of dueling egos. Like Castro's Marxist experiment, what the United States has done for the past 54 years just hasn't worked. You know, even the Cuba book, which is probably the least in that way, and um, when, when Zanny was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis, we would go take her out of school in February because that was the cold and flu season, especially in grade school and go to Florida. I had a one-week teaching gig in St. Petersburg and then would go to Miami Beach for a month. It was a really nice way to get away from the winter, but we met a lot of Cubans there. And I became fascinated with their story because they're, you know, I have some Latin blood, for lack of a better term, Mediterranean blood, and, and I could relate to them culturally, but also I spent a lot of time in a communist country so I could relate to that. And so that, was, that book was really an outgrowth of my interest in those kinds of things. The Italian Summer, Golf, Food, and Family at Lake Cuomo. It was the best family vacation we ever had. It was kind of the flip side of that, um, that time in our life that I mentioned earlier when we got bad news and, you know, money right. was tight. Um, this was an absolutely perfect family vacation at Lake Cuomo, which is the most beautiful place I've ever seen on earth. And they have a nice golf course there, and there's four or five other courses within driving distance. So I played golf. My family and I traveled around to every different restaurant we could find. I met some interesting, funny characters, and I wrote a, a memoir about it. And uh, I, I have never enjoyed researching a book as much as I enjoyed The Italian Summer. No, oh, this is, it's a wonderful part of the world. But you find beautiful villages. Oh, incredible. <laughs> and nice people and unbelievable food. And the golf was, you know, the golf was good. It wasn't, um, 
I have played a lot in Italy, actually, and the courses around Rome are really our world class. This was not a world class course, but it was fun. It was fun. Um, it's amazing to me that I've never in my life wished I was shorter, but now I do. <laughs> <laughs> that um, Avizzano is going to be mentioned in both these readings, and we didn't plan it that way. So I'm going to read a little bit about a disastrous um, trip to Italy that I took with my mother, who's now 91, so then she was about... 81. Uh, my wife, Amanda, long-suffering. My two girls, who Alexandra and Juliana, who were five and one and a half at the time. And we've been to Italy a bunch of times, and uh, this was the only bad trip we had, but it was real bad. <laughs> it, it was so bad that the only way I could psychologically deal with it was to come home and write something funny about it, which I tried to do. Um, it was my fault. I wanted to get out of the New England winter. I thought Italy would be warm. I rented a house in the mountains near Rieti, which is like an hour and a half north of Rome, which is not warm, at least in February. Uh, we were there one night. The house was freezing cold. Juliana started to throw up, threw up for the next seven days. Um, went to the emergency room in in Rome, got lost, the whole, it was just one awful thing after another. And um, I feel a very strong responsibility, I think like most fathers and mothers do, to make my children happy. So I decided I was gonna abandon the rental that we had for three weeks and go to Lecce. If you know Italian geography, Lecce is like 600 miles south of Contigliano, which was the little town we were in. And um, so this is the story of the first day of that ride when I caught the flu that Juliana had. And, um, you're perfectly welcome to laugh at our misfortunes. And, uh, yeah, there's a whole book, this is a whole book, and it's serialized in my um, newsletter that my publisher sends out every month. And it's, um, we eventually got to Lecce where uh, Alexandra fell out of the bed and smashed her head. Um, I, I had the flu for a week. We finally, I finally recovered, played in a golf tournament with my mother, decided to abandon Italy and drive home, and drive back up to the airport in Milan, which was another 700 miles. My wife got a piece of metal in her eye, got infected. Juliana got a urinary infection. She had 104 temperature at 3 o'clock in the morning, 30 miles from the nearest hospital, and on and on and on. <laughs> At the very end of the book, I turned to my mother. When we finally got back to America, I said, Mom, next time, Florida. <laughs> You know, that's another good question I don't, uh, that I haven't ever had before. I don't know. I, I, what happened to me in Italy was really interesting because it, um, you know, I'm half Italian, but, but I, my upbringing was seven-eighths or three-quarters, that my Italian half was, I lived with them, literally. And, um, and then when I left, I was sometimes uh, the victim of ridicule people making fun of Italians, and I know my father was much more than I was, and I'm sure my grandfather was even more than that, but, but it was hurtful to me, and um, I was always proud of that part of my family, and I loved it. My particular family, especially, is very loving and warm and um, kind people. There was no, you know, we had cousins at my house, my grandmother's house, every Sunday, and I had 38 I think on that side I have 28 first cousins. 
<laughs> and they would all come, and their parents would come, and sometimes other, you know, and there was no fights, there was no meanness, there was, it just was a little magical kingdom. It was hard to leave uh, and go into the real world, you know. Uh, so I was always proud of it. It was not like I was ever ashamed of it, but it was it was hurtful. When I was at Exodus, sometimes there was a little of that. St. John's Prep, there was some of that. Uh, college, there was some of that. And certainly not as bad as what African Americans deal with, but it's parallel. It's not nearly as bad, but it's parallel. You know, people, images on television that, that you know, that associate the, the ethnicity with the mafia, you know, or... Jersey Shore, you know, and um, bad jokes. You know, I may have a sense of humor. It depends on who's making a joke. But but when I went to Italy, it made me very proud because I, um, I'll give you another example. We just went to Naples. Uh, when that same girl left, uh, left home to go to the Camino, she went to Naples first to do volunteer work. And we said, even though we really did not have the money at the time, which this was a few months ago, I said, I, I think we should go because she's really leaving home. This is our daughter who's, you know, our oldest girl. And this is, she's going to leave home now. She's probably not going to come back. And I want to go with her. I don't want to just put her on the plane and say, go to Naples and then walk the Camino. See you later. So we went to Naples. And Naples, I, uh, it's, it's like similar to the other story. I avoided Naples. been to Italy ten times my People come from Naples, and I didn't want to go because everything I read about Naples was pickpockets, crime, the mafia, filthy streets, you know. And I, I was kind of afraid to go. I'm going with two teenage girls. The guy's going to grab them as you walk. You know, I had all these images that, that I got from popular culture, from reading, from uh, travel articles. And so we go to Naples, and I'm like, I got my passport here. I got my my hand in my pocket. I'm looking around for anybody who's going to touch my daughters. You know, that was like, and, and the people were unbelievably kind and generous. And, you know, the, the guy showed us to the apartment who was very nice. And I said, you know, can we walk around this neighborhood? He said, yeah, you can. I said, how about at night? He said, oh, no, no, I don't want to walk around at night. We walked around at night all the time. We never had any problems. Nobody picked our pocket. In fact, it was just the opposite. People did the most incredibly generous things that I've seen anywhere on earth, and I've traveled to places where there are a lot of nice people. And so it just made me proud of it. It like reawakened something inside me that I was proud of and valued. It wasn't just proud of, as that I valued that heritage in me. I'm not saying I never was a person who said. We're better than you are because you're not Italian. I don't like that. That's, I'm not that kind of a person. But I was proud of that heritage. And, and when I went to a place like Naples and saw the way that people behave and the way they live, it made me more proud. And I think it, in some weird way, boosted my creative confidence. I don't know how else to explain it because nobody has ever asked that question. But I think it's a good question. And I think in order to have the chutzpah, which is an Italian word, to, <laughs> to, um, to write something and, and expect people to read it, that's asking a lot. You know, I'm going to write something, and, and you're going to pay money for it, and you're going to spend 20 hours reading my words. There's a certain amount of ego that has to be there. You know, and, and some of it's ego in a bad way, but a lot of it's just that kind of confidence that you have something to say, you know. And I think that was bolstered by going to Italy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I tend to give long answers. <laughs> but that nobody's ever asked that before, and it's interesting for me to think about that. Yeah. That's the, the lesson for me in my life is that, you know, people focus on the the surfaces a lot. You know, we identify ourselves as a, a Vermonter or a white male or a, you know, old, young, rich, poor, American, non-Christian, Muslim, whatever. But for whatever reason, I tend to focus below that when I deal with people. And um, I think, I don't know exactly where that came from, but that's the way I operate. And um, when I write, so I wrote a book of talk funny girl about a 17 year old girl that's set in new hampshire and people say to me how did you how do you how do you know what it's like to be a 17 year old girl i say i don't know but i'm a human being 
she's a human being and I focus on the human aspects of her, not so much her age, not so much her gender. And if you do that, there is a there is a commonality. I mean, we're not we're not all exactly the same, obviously, but there's a I think we're more alike than different. I guess I would say it that way. So for this book, The Talk Funny Girl, you created this whole new dialect. Why did you choose to create this dialect? Why did you decide that this is how you were going to write this book? Well, I did do it to show how isolated they were. I think you need sometimes a concrete manifestation of something rather than telling it, rather than saying they're isolated. You need to find a way to show them as isolated people. And her par- Marjorie's parents are so intent on staying apart from society and keeping her apart from society. That's really their whole way of being in the world. And I wanted something that demonstrated that in, um, in every interaction that they had. But I do uh, have a fascination with the way people deal with difficult things in their life. Really, most of my, I think this is my 13th book, and most of those books have to do with people encountering some real hardship in life. I have a book about a a guy who was in Vietnam. I have a book about people who are divorced. I have a book about uh, a young woman with cystic fibrosis. And um, what's fascinating to me is how people deal with those things. Do they transcend them? Do they become bitter? Do they end up taking out their pain on the next generation or their friends or spouse or lovers? And I don't do that on purpose. It just seems to be what I end up writing about. So in, in Marjorie's case, I wanted to see how she, as an adult, how she dealt with the difficult, really horrible things that had happened to her as a child. Now she said the Talk Funny Girl was a departure from my other books. It's a dark book, um, not about uh, Riviere or Buddhism or Italian-Americans or any of those things I usually write about. What prompted it is just my concern for poor people, and poor kids especially, and I feel they, they become invisible in our society, and uh, the rural poor, which really is the majority of the poor, especially, are especially invisible, and I like to drive around, and I've seen those people, and I, I just felt I wanted to give voice to them in some way. I've had that asked of me a lot, and I don't, I don't really know the answer, except uh, I have two daughters, you know, but... I don't think that's it. I think um, the place I try to go when I write the more serious material is deep into a person and deep into myself. And I think at that level, you know, superficial things like race and gender and age really don't matter as much. I think we're all really very much alike at that level. And so um, I tried to go there with Marjorie and just see her as a person. And I also try to avoid what I think is a mistake that some men make when they write about women, you know, talking about, you know, certain particular things that that they think will make them sound like they know what it's like to be a woman, you know, like their period or uh, the way the bra feels on their, you know, that kind of stuff. I really worked hard not to go there with her and just... um, (laughs) She lives in Riviera where I grew up. Very modest kind of life, uh, has a few friends, doesn't have a big social life, lives with her father, who's widowed and a little bit older, uh, very close to her grandmother. And really her life centers around the church. She prays every day. She's going to nursing school. But most of the most important part of her life is really her prayer life. I try to keep the focus um, on Cynthia. And, and on her interior life. The trick, the difficulty in this book for me is that interior life, uh, uh, we all have one, and it's a very, very important part, but it's difficult to make a book interesting about that unless there's something going on in the mm-hmm. exterior world. So I think there are enough other characters and enough progression in, in her path um, toward understanding what she's actually supposed to be doing, that, that it's not totally interior. So that was the challenge for me, was trying to, trying to write a book about the interior life that wasn't so slow and profound that it wouldn't, it wouldn't grab the reader. Dimension. So Otto, because of that first road trip, 
is convinced that, okay, he's a good man, he believes in some kind of God, he, he's a good father, good husband, doing the right thing, but he's convinced after that road trip that he can go deeper than that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the Rinpoche gets him into meditation and just opens his mind about the ways that he could be in the world the way, different ways he could react to, to situations in the world. And lunch takes him even deeper than that. Lunch has a little bit more of a serious bent to it, although there's a lot of humor in it also. And I found his penchant for introspection highly interesting. Lunch with Buddha by Roland Marullo was a thought-provoking, insightful, wonderful examination of the journey we are all on. As did Otto, I found some of his lessons obscure and tangled as a string of a thousand lights. But in the end, Otto and I discover the points Volya Rinpoche tries to make. While not easy to accept some of his lessons, we must admit to the truths they contain. The third volume in this series, Dinner with Buddha, is near the top of my TBR pile. Five stars. And Rinpoche is trying to convey that to Otto, that, you know, you, first of all, you can't, but you also shouldn't try to manage every aspect of your life and plan everything out. This is the way it's going to be because there are surprises and you have to be able to ride those surprises. It's a good message, actually. Works for me. I mean, in lunch with Buddha and breakfast with Buddha and American Savior, golf with God, I don't preach. I don't have anything I would preach. It's not like I'm trying to convert people to what? I don't have a nameable religion myself. My, my path is really a hybrid. And, but I do like to make people think. I think those are big, the big questions. Religion is supposed to answer the big questions or at least entertain the big questions. Why are we here? Why do we suffer? Why do we die? Why were we born in the first place? What happens afterwards? Those are the questions that religions purport to answer. And those are questions that sometimes we just stop asking. So I like to ask them in different ways with a sense of humor and, and from different angles because really religions answer those questions in different ways. I just felt like a shame where you would see that our food has been adulterated. And it's a struggle for many, many people, including many people close to me, People struggle with body image, we're constantly being propagandized about how we should look, and we struggle with weight issues as a society. So I thought Rinpoche would notice that, and out of compassion, he would say, oh, I'm going to do a weight loss. I'm going to try my, you know, weight loss would extend to be, okay, you can eat this, you can count this, this is so many points, don't eat that, which is perfectly fine. It works for some people, including people I love. But his view was totally interior. It was much more controlling the way your mind works. And I happen to have grown up, unfortunately, surrounded by addiction. Terrible, terrible addiction that absolutely devastated the lives of people I love. Gambling, drugs, alcohol, and to a lesser extent, sex work and talking. And the people who can't stop talking. They, they become lonely because nobody wants to be around them. It's, you have to be in here to want to be around these people. So that's a form of addiction, which I'm going to use the term why I'm going to end. But the book moves from being a weight loss book to being a book about addiction and the way the mind works, the way the addicted mind works, which unfortunately is a subject I know all too well. A little bit myself, but mainly in people I love whose lives have been totally ruined. And that moves to uh, the issue of self-acceptance or self-love. It's a sequel to Revere Beach Boulevard. You can read it, obviously, freestanding. I wrote it so you don't have to read Revere Beach Boulevard. But what I was trying to do in both books is show addiction and the way it affects people surrounding the addict. 
But because I saw how many people liked Revere Beach Boulevard, I decided to publish it. There's a lot of trouble in the book. Like you said, there's gambling, there's a mob. The mob, Revere had a mafia uh, presence, Um, not so much anymore, but when I was growing up, it certainly did, and Greater Boston certainly did. So that was implanted uh, in my thoughts, really, that idea. And most of what I write comes from things that I care about or or have seen or experienced. I don't don't really write at arm's length. Mm -hmm. Is that good? For me, it's good. Yeah, I published 19 books, and I, I may at some point run out of things that I deeply care about, but so far I have. That's only part of the book. The other stuff is safety, where to stand, where not to stand. Um, if you have a ball that you're going to hit and there's a tree in front of you, it's probably wiser to, to punch it out sideways, um, rake the sand traps, all the stuff, all the little courtesies that regular golfers know. And new golfers really don't know. Don't walk in somebody's line, how to mark your ball in the green, all that kind of stuff. I think the last part of it is um, just enjoy the game. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very, very difficult game. It's the most frustrating athletic activity I know I've ever done. And um, ultimately, I try to remind myself, you know, I'm out on the golf course. I should be enjoying it. I made a triple bogey. It's okay. You know, I'm not being tortured, I'm not at work, I'm not in the hospital, I'm playing golf. So if there's one lesson from the book, I think it would be just have fun, enjoy the great game. One of the other books you wrote is called Demons of the Blank Page, 15 Obstacles to Keep You from Writing and How to Conquer Them. Obviously, I'm not going to have you list all 15 of them, but tell me one or two that you think are really important. Writer's block is the number one, and uh, every writer I know at some point in his or her career has encountered that. And, um, you know, I taught for seven years at Bennington and three years at Amherst College, and I, I saw it a lot, and I thought about it a lot. I've experienced it a little bit. And I think what it always comes down to is an excess of self-criticism. And people say, no, I'm depressed, I don't have time, or I don't have any ideas yet, but if you really look deep inside the thought process of that person there's a little voice that's saying you can't do this this is no good it's not as good as the other student in the class or it's you know why does the world need my books there's so many of them out there i'll never be dostoevsky and so on and so forth and that voice if it gets if it gets a little bit too loud it really paralyzes people so that was really the i think the most important chapter in demons of the blank page is is on a writer's block I, I, you know, I talk to I talk to schools a lot, and everything from third grade to to graduate school and and, and writers conferences where people are you know up to eighty, ninety years old. So I, I I talk to the whole spectrum of writers, and that's a common question for people. Who say I don't know how to finish the book, and I think I think one way to think about that is that there is there is not one right ending for the book. There are definitely wrong endings, but there might be 10 right endings, and you, your job is to find one of those right endings. And if you start to think, I have to find the exact right one right ending, I think that inhibits people. Um, and I'm, I'm mostly not done when the book is done. You know, I mean, those people, like in this case, they went on and on and on. And, and really, I could, there's little bits of Leaving Los Apis in Revere Beach Boulevard. There's a couple of characters from Leaving Los Apis who ended up in Revere Beach Boulevard, which was my third book. So I think they're just, there's some point where you feel like you have to stop the story. It's like you, I'm telling you a story at a, at a cocktail party, and you know, I could go on for an hour, but at, at the 10 minute mark, I feel like, okay, you got the general idea, you know, and I should shut up, you know, and so. There's also the consideration of how long the book is. I mean, it can't be 100 pages, and it shouldn't be 650 pages, although occasionally some people write that long. Um, so all those things go together, and you just say, okay, this feels like a place that I could end. But it isn't black and white for me, and, and actually the book I'm working on now, it's difficult for me, because I have so many different threads, and I want, you want the ending to be a little surprising, but not, not so shocking that nobody could see it coming. You know, like the end of Vatican Waltz is, is shocking for some people. But if you actually look through the book, you can carefully, you could see what leads up to it. So it's, 
it's like finding the right title. You know, it's, um, it's not easy. I think the hardest thing about writing is that there's no real absolute guidelines. And any teacher who, any teacher at any level who says you always have to do this and you can never do that, I, I don't trust that person. I, I think that's bad advice. You know, you always have to write dialogue that's, dialogue can't ever be longer than three lines, I've heard someone say. I had a teacher who told me, three lines of dialogue, that's it. And that's ridiculous, you know. Or the sentences have to be short, or, the, or you can't use adverbs, or whatever, you know, I mean, see, I, I'm a novelist, I'm gonna go on and on and on. I'm glad you read I never do, I never do. Because it deadens it for me. If, I, if I'm writing to an end, I'm dead. I just uh, everything is flat. I feel like I'm I'm writing bad journalism. You know, I have to surprise myself as I go, and that's the most fun. That's the most fun. Is all of a sudden you say, "Oh, I'm taking a walk down my road," and I say, "Oh, you know, this could happen." You know, and sometimes this is not good. It's not a good idea. You know, and sometimes it is a good idea. But it's Bernard Malmud, who I saw talk right before he died. He said. Um, oh, was it Bernard Malamud or John Gardner? I think it was John Gardner. said, surprise is the heart of fiction. And, you know, it, you don't want the reader to know the end when, when he or she is reading along. And so I don't know the end. When I'm, and I literally don't know the end. I don't know even the last line until I get to the last line. And then when I get to the end and I know it's the end, then I go back to the beginning and make sure that the end makes sense. You know, I put in little things in there so that the end is not such a surprise that it doesn't make sense. One of the things you have to have tolerance for if you, if you write professionally is, is rereading and rereading and to the point where it would drive most people insane. And, you know, sometimes you have to take a break. And sometimes I will put something aside for a bit and then, you know, as long as I can, a week, two weeks, a month, and go back to it. Because the problem is it's a conflict of interest. I mean, you're asking your brain to be objective about something it created, which is not possible. You know? And so you have to, I feel like you have to trick your brain into looking at it as if it, it hadn't created it. So I have different ways of doing that. So I'll, I'll, I'll even with what I'm working on now, after all these years, I'll, I'll just, I'll finish writing for the day, and I'll, I'll flip down the screen and go to page 84 and just read page 84. Because if you read the story from the beginning, you kind of get like a momentum, you know, and you, you just want to keep going. Part of you just wants to keep going. And um, Hemingway used to say he'd take a, like a, an index card and read one word and say, is that the right word? Read the next word, is that the right, you know, I, I, that's what he said, I don't know, that, that would drive me completely crazy. <laughs> but I do try sometimes to vary the speeds at which I read, so I'll read really, really slowly. Occasionally I'll read aloud. Often I'll read standing up, like I'll put something on the table and just stand there and look at it, or I'll read in my kitchen or in a cafe rather than, the, you know, my desk. Um, and those are all ways of tricking your, your brain into try to seeing it a little bit differently. And definitely I print it out. I can't do that well on the screen. It's because something mesmerizing about the screen, it just kind of hypnotizes me into thinking it's on, you know, it looks okay. But if I print it out and I'll, I'll have a pen and really take my time, then for some reason I can see it much more clearly. And I just love the, the whole process. You know, it's like you, it's like building a table and and then you're sanding and polishing and f finishing, staining and finishing it. You know, it, it just, you can take something that, that's kind of pretty good and make it very good. And you can take something that's, you know, 80% and make it 95%, which is probably the best you'll ever get. And I do everything from, you know, punctuation to, if I have a big, you know, I'll get to a place and I'll say, okay, it's just too thin. There's not enough, that it wants more. So and I can't think of what it wants right now. So I'll put a box, a little rectangle next to it and color it in. That's my signal to myself that the next time I go, I should look at that and maybe by then I will have thought of something. Um, as I said, I used to, it used to be harder to, to cut stuff, but I taught at Bennington in the 90s and I had a lot of students and a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. 
uh, tutorials, they used to call them, with kids writing novels. And I'd say, you know, Justin, that, that, that paragraph is just, you know, the, the, I love that paragraph. What do you mean? I, how, what? I said, it just doesn't fit. It, wait, you, it's, it doesn't belong. You know, if you want to keep it, fine, it's your book. But I can't believe you said that. I, you know, and it made me look at myself and say, I'm doing the same thing. Like, I, I have these absurd infatuations for no good reason with a word or a character or a moment or even a chapter. And my brain has just put that on there, so it thinks, oh, yeah, that's really and good. I feel like, and this is a little bit connected to the, the coming through the writer question, that the secret, for me anyway, is um, the different ways I think of it, like putting a pipe down to get oil or water in, in, a, in an oil well or a water well, and, and knowing where the oil is and putting the pipe down being able to put the pipe down to get that, that material out. Uh, and I also think of it in terms of like tuning a radio so that you get the static off the channel and you get the clear channel. That, as time has gone on, I think partly because of meditating and partly just from writing for so many years that it's easier for me to go to get the material out. It comes out much more easily than it used to. There's not so much static there. Um, I just know, I know how to go to get it. And I don't suffer from writer's block really at all, and uh, or very little. And um, I do credit meditation for that. And it's actually, for me, it, as long as I'm speaking about meditation, it's not so much that I have any particular great experiences meditating, but the way it affects the rest of my life, how long it takes me to get angry at my children in a particular circumstance Without the meditation, I think I would have gotten angry much more quickly, and now I can see that coming. I, I have a lot of depression in my family, and in some cases it immobilizes, paralyzes some of my family members, and I had uh, something like mm, bipolar disease when I was younger. I would be very happy and very unhappy, and meditation has really taken that away almost completely. Those are, that's enough for me. I mean, if I, if you know, if, if, if some other great interior event happens someday, that would be wonderful. But even just to be able to, you know, get, get upset at my daughter in the fifth minute instead of the first minute, or even sometimes not get upset, or in the middle of being upset realize what a jerk I am, or realize that I should be upset, you know, just to have a little clearer mind about things, that has been very helpful. Rewriting, which I really enjoy. Uh, some people find it really tedious, but I'm a, a Virgo, and Virgos are like, you know, lining up their forks and spoons, and, and, and uh, I used to be a carpenter, and if the corner, if I cut a corner and was just a little bit off, I'd go crazy, you know. My wife would come, what's wrong? She'd come to the job site, she'd say, look, look at, the, look at the miter in that, she'd say, well, it looks fine to me. I said, well, look at it, it's terrible, it's, uh, it's off, it's off by a sixteenth of an inch. She said, oh, it's okay, nobody else is going to see it. So I like the rewriting and the, you know, the fine tuning and changing the punctuation, adding a little, making a scene a little fatter or a little thinner, and making a character, um, trying to find unusual ways to make a person, a real person on the page. Yeah, you know, we took those trips. Those are all real. Oh, great shirt. Oh, great shirt. Oh, I thought you said it was a great trip. No, no, no. You said you see people. This shirt, this is a $500 shirt. It's handed down this kind of And I see a shirt. That's nice because I had a choice of what shirt to wear tonight. They brought two with me, and I said, I'm going to go with the old white shirt. Ah, right, good. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's one of my favorites, and I don't wear a shirt with a collar very I'm usually a t shirt guy. Yeah, that's a great one. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> get this, Michael, get this. Is this being gotten on tape and everything? <laughs> well, most of it. Anything else you want? Would you? <laughs> a face, right? <laughs> Just kidding. I'm sorry. I can get a little goofy. I'll go for another couple of minutes. I don't want to keep you guys too long. Yeah.
I thought, okay, you know, it's interesting. We have the Dalai Lama who's alive, and at that time a new pope, both of whom are, I think, remarkable people, and both of whom push the boundaries of their faith. They don't try to convince other people to believe what they believe, but they try to be more universal. The Dalai Lama's famous um, statement, my religion is kindness. And, you know, that, if you think about that, it's, to me, an incredible thing to say when you're the head of a particular religion that has a, a, an ancient tradition, billion followers or more, and a lot of political pressure. For him to do that, I think, took great courage. And I think the Pope has exhibited that kind of courage, too. So this was my basic line of thinking. And I thought, how can I write about that? And how can I make it funny? And in my mind was the, an article, one of these little, you know, you're looking through a newspaper and you come across this little paragraph that big. And I probably maybe 15 years ago had read this little piece about Pope, I think it was Pope Paul, definitely wasn't Benedict, who loved to ski. And he would sneak away from the Vatican with, with an aide and go up to Cortina d'Ampezzo, which is like the equivalent of Vail in the famous ski area in Italy, and ski. And as incognito as a pope can be. He wasn't in disguise, but I'm sure he was not wearing his official white robes. And he'd ski for a day, and I, it just, it really struck me. Um, and then I started to think about what their lives must be like the incredible pressure that they have on the political pressure and the bureaucracies that they sit atop, the different things that different followers want them to say or do or not to say or do, the rigorous schedule of meeting people, flying places. And I thought maybe they would just like a break, you know. Maybe they would just want to be ordinary people for a couple of days and, and get away from all that, like the Pope who went skiing. So that was the main idea, and then I just started the, I call it scratching, but, you know, making little notes. I'm, I'm not sure if I typed them or hand wrote them or both, probably both. And um, I, I tried to, to come up with an idea of how they would get together, how they would be able to travel um, without being recognized immediately. And I wanted to make it funny, but as with the Buddha books and Vatican Waltz and those other books, Golfing with God, I, I want them to be funny. I want them to be entertaining. Uh, but I don't want them to be fluff. I, I don't want to write a book that you read on an airplane and throw away when you're, before you're getting your bags. You know? So that's a difficult uh, balance to strike a lot of times. And it's also difficult to write about religion because it's a subject that people can be very sensitive about whether they are members of a particular faith or atheists, both can be very, have very strong opinions about any mention of God, the God word or um, spirituality or anything like that is really loaded territory for a lot of people. And I understand that. So I found that trying to take a little bit of a light approach is helpful. I'm not pedantic. I'm not a preachy type person. I don't have anything to convert anybody to. And if I did, I wouldn't do that. It's just not my nature as a human being. I did not want to have the Pope and Dalai Lama narrating the book. I wanted to have somebody more human, more ordinary. So I came up with this idea that the Pope's cousin would be his first assistant, Paolo. And he's a, he's a man of faith, but he's, his faith is nothing like the popes or the Dalai Lamas. And the pope says to him, the Dalai Lama is visiting the Vatican, and the pope says to him, we want to take a trip. And Paolo says, oh, no problem. I'll get the travel office. We'll arrange it, you know, your holiness. And the pope says, no, we want to take a trip, and we don't want anybody to know about it. And Paolo says, you're the two most recognizable people on earth. How do you think that's going to happen? And the pope says, you figure it out. <laughs> And Paolo is kind of a neurotic guy. He's had a very checkered employment history and mostly filled with failure. And he was married, but he and his wife, are, they're not divorced, but they're separated. They're friendly, and they have a daughter, but they're separated. 
And his wife is like the polar opposite of Paolo. She's feisty and adventurous and um, imaginative, and he's a straight arrow, neurotic, worried all the time about what might happen, and very reluctantly, when he goes back to his office and he realizes he could never pull this off in a million years, very reluctantly, he calls Rosa and asks for her help, which excites her tremendously. She said, this is a great adventure. And she has made a, a great living as a hairdresser and makeup person. She has studios all over Italy. So they sneak, she says, meet me, sneak them out and meet me outside the Vatican at 3 a.m., which is a whole other story, and he manages to do that. And she shows up in a Maserati. And Paolo says, what is wrong with you? We're trying to keep it as low profile. And she, said, she kind of gives him a smirk and says, what's the last car that you would expect the Pope and the Dalai Lama to travel around in? <laughs> and then she takes them to one of her studios where this big weightlifter guy makes them up into very different looking people. And then she invites herself on the trip. So the four of them get in the Maserati and go around Italy. And Rosa kind of stole the book in a way because she's not at all afraid to ask the Pope or the Dalai Lama any question imaginable. At one point she says to the Pope, you know, what's the problem with sex in the Catholic Church? I mean, I love sex. I think it's the most beautiful thing. It, it gave us our daughter. It, why is it sinful? I, you know, really, and her husband's saying, Rosa, will you please stop? You know, she, and she says, why should I stop? This is our one chance to be with these people. I want to ask them. I want, you know. And so she really pushes the Pope and Dalai Lama into places that they might not want to go. And then at the very end, I well, shouldn't say that part. <laughs> there were a couple of places where, you know, you'd go into a cafe and they'd have statues of Mussolini and Mussolini postcards up there. That was a little bit disconcerting for me, but it turned out that we actually lived on the road where Mussolini was killed where he was executed wow. and there's a tiny little plaque about 200 yards down the road from our house benito mussolini um, i think he died april 29 1945 if i'm not mistaken and um i thought i asked people i said what's that plaque doing there and they said that's you know they they grabbed him as he was trying to get to the swiss border which is only a few miles away brought him uh, into these hills, he spent one night, and then they took him to this villa and shot him right in the middle of the street. It's an amazing story. I mean, the uh, the Mussolini story, the last chapter of his life is really, it's like a, I don't know, it's like a soap opera. I mean, he's traveling, you know, with his mistress and his wife, and he's trying to escape. He's dressed in a German uniform. He's got these Hitler's guys minding him and trying to get him out of the country, and the Italian partisans are trying to catch him, and they finally catch him. Somebody tips him off. They catch him. They shoot him. I mean, then they bring him to Milan and hang him upside down so people can spit it on him. And it's a, it was an incredible saga, and um, kind of odd to be there in that spectacularly beautiful, lush, happy place and see this little black stone marker at the side of the road. I'm thinking there's a book in here somewhere. I'm thinking too. My grandmother was uh, in Mass General Hospital. She had Alzheimer's by then. She had lived with relatives for a while, and it turned out to be too much for them to care for her, as is often the case with Alzheimer's patients. And reluctantly, she had been put into a nursing home. She developed a cyst in her left cheek and um, had, to, had got infected. She had to have it surgically removed, and so she was taken to Mass General. So I don't know exactly why, but that night I decided I wanted to go see her. I drove to Mass General. In those years, for those of you who don't know and not old enough to know, they were very strict about uh, visiting hours in, in hospitals. Usually it was like 1 to 4 in the afternoon, 7 to 9 at night. And that's when if you had someone in there who was ill, you could go visit them. And it was already 9 o'clock, and I knew it was too late. But something made me drive to Mass General, park my car, walk in, and get on the elevator. I was the only um, non-medical person on the elevator, a couple of doctors and a few nurses. And one of the doctors said to me, where are you going? And I said, look, I know it's, I know it's 920. 
I'm visiting hours are over, but my grandmother's here. I'm very close to her. I was wondering if I could just go upstairs for a few minutes and say, say a word to her. And he looked at me and said, who's your grandmother? And I said, Eleonora Marullo. And he said, a special woman. Now, maybe he was just being kind. It's possible. I don't think so. What I think is that even through the veil of her illness, she was an 83-year-old woman, ill, in pain, with Alzheimer's, lying in the bed. Even through that disguise, I think he saw the, the special love, the glow, the light that emanated from that person. And he said, go ahead, go upstairs. So I walked upstairs, I took the elevator upstairs, I walked into my grandmother's room. She turned and looked at me, and this magnificent smile bloomed on her face for all of about one second. And then the pain from the surgical incision cut that smile short. I sat with her for a little while, told her I loved her. Uh, she couldn't speak, I was talking to her a little bit kissed her goodbye and never saw her alive again. But I will always remember that smile because to me it was a symbol of the person that she was in life. And, and here she was in tremendous pain, perhaps knew that she was going to die in another day or two. And her first instinct, even through her illness, was to give, was to show affection, to show warmth, to make someone else in the world feel good when many people in that situation would be filled with self-pity are really struggling with the pain. I believe that she had transcended that. That's the way I think of it, is I want that dimension to my books. I really do. And to give solace to people and entertain them that's something I could say. If I did that, I, I would be happy with what I've done in the world, with what I've done with my life.